some of them are. <laughs> you really are. Some of them are really. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. My name is Torsten Bell. I'm the uh, Chief Executive of the Resolution Foundation. You are very welcome here today. Now, uh, we care about living standards. The, um, this is a big day for us. This is our annual living standards audit, taking a look at what's happened to living standards across the country and where that leaves uh, people today. And I do sometimes worry, as people that are quite focused on living standards, that the last decade is a bit like a lot of Trump tweets. Okay. Now, by that I mean, we see these tweets, everyone has a row about racism, but one of the effects of it is to slowly, over time, normalise things which are not normal. Okay. Uh, that's my last bit of kind of angry propaganda. My basic point, though, is the last decade of squeezed living standards, the danger of it, apart from we're all poorer than we should be, is that we start to think that this is normal. That you know, the families not seeing living standards growth is what 21st century Britain is about. And if we do that, one, that's wrong. But two, it can drive us to fatalism. So this report doesn't just say, uh, look, living standards have been really bad in recent years. Although, don't worry, it is going to say that. They have just to cut to the chase. Um, but it also says, what are the lessons from history? And what, are, what do we know about the nature of 21st century Britain that can tell us something about what we do about that? The, um, uh, and so that is as much a focus of this as the kind of raw data crunching. Now, on doing... After you've heard from Adam Call at one of our authors setting out the summary of that uh, report, John McDonnell, who is the Shadow Chancellor and doesn't need very much introduction, is going to set out what he would do if an election turns up in the autumn. Who knows? Anything can happen these days. Fingers crossed. Okay, fingers crossed. There he says. Uh, there about what he would do. And then we're going to hear from uh, Sam Smethers, Chief Executive of the Fawcett Society, because as I know you're all going to read all of this report, a lot of it deals with the fact that how have we been driving living standards in Britain over the last 25 years? Women to be blunt. It doesn't quite say it like that, but you get the idea. Women into work and women's earnings rising faster than men's earnings over that phase. And then lastly, we're going to hear from Mike Brewer, who is Professor of economic, Economics at Essex University and the author of a new book, which in brackets you can buy upstairs afterwards, after you've bought our report, which is free, there uh, on inequality and what you can do about it. So that is the plan for this session. And then we're going to get um, <coughs> time for some questions and answers from you. So Adam, you're going to kick us off with some slides. Thanks, Torsten. Um, so yeah, there's a, a big new report out on our website. So, um, do go check that out. I'm not going to try to uh, uh, go through all of the findings in that report. Um, I'm just going. <laughs> Sorry, I don't seem to have uh, control here. Okay, we're in business. Sorry. So, yes, I'm going to uh, present uh, a few of the, the key trends from the past 25 years of what's driven uh, living standards growth and what the next Prime Minister or government should do to uh, get back to inclusive growth. Um, so first, I thought I'd start with some good news for once. Um, if you step back and look at the uh, really big picture, uh, households are essentially richer than ever. Um, incomes have roughly tripled since 1961, which is uh, when this data began. Uh, and that works out as annual growth of about 2% a year. So, so that's kind of what the long-term norm is. Um, but growth has certainly not been steady. Um, if you go back to around the millennium, for example, uh, incomes each year were growing quite a bit faster than that. Uh, and of course, in the financial crisis, uh, household incomes actually fell. Um, though actually if you look just before the financial crisis as well, what we call the pre-crisis slowdown, uh, household income growth was also a bit lower than 2% um, when measured after housing costs. Um, and more recently, uh, there was a bit of a recovery period. You might remember when uh, inflation was around zero, which gave a nice boost to households. Um, but what's happened most recently, over the last couple of years, household incomes have actually uh, seem to have fallen slightly. Uh, and as Tolson said, that really isn't normal. 
over the past two years, incomes have fallen by about uh, half, half a percent. Uh, and that's actually the worst on record outside of recessions, and indeed perhaps worse than the 1990s recession. So pretty terrible. Um, that's the story for typical incomes, but we can also look at uh, growth right across uh, the population from the poorest on the left uh, to the richest on the right. Uh, if we look, for example, at that recovery period, you see that growth was actually uh, fairly evenly felt. Uh, with the highest income growth, about 2% in the middle. Uh, over the past two years, for, um, in comparison, uh, growth has been somewhat unequal. So incomes have grown faster uh, for higher income households. Uh, and for the bottom 20% or so, the fall in incomes has actually been even worse than at the median. Uh, and you can also compa compare that to the financial crisis. Uh, and it may well be that the last two years have been worse for them than the financial crisis was. Um, so there's clearly a, a real need for um, inclusive growth again. What has driven growth in the past? Well, if we look at GDP, um, obviously the, the main driver of GDP growth has been productivity growth. Um, there's been some contributions in the past pre-crisis from population, from rising employment, uh, not from hours, which have uh, tended to fall um, over time. Um, so a key thing has been productivity growth and related uh, hourly wage growth. Um, but over the past decade or so, we've not had any wage growth. Uh, wages are still uh, lower on average than they were just before the financial crisis, um, though the gap is, uh, is rapidly uh, shrinking now. Uh, and in the absence of that growth, uh, what little GDP growth there has been has been dominated by population growth so it accounted for over two-thirds of GDP growth, so GDP per capita uh, uh, growth has been even weaker. Uh, as Torsten mentioned, uh, female uh, employment income has played a key role. Um, employment more generally has, has done quite well. Uh, part of the story is the female state pension age going up from 60 to 65 and then 66 next year. Um, but there have also been more general improvements, and uh, the report looks in detail at uh, the employment performance of single parents and uh, second earners especially. Um, and we've had a, a pause in that uh, long-term decline in average hours. Um, so average hours fell by about one per week, um, uh, one hour a week uh, every four years in the long term. But over the last decade or so, that, uh, that downwards trend has just stopped. Uh, helping to support uh, household incomes, but obviously uh, the expense of leisure time. Uh, and finally, we shouldn't underestimate the importance of falls in uh, interest rates for people with mortgages. Uh, their average housing costs uh, as a share of that income have fallen from 20% in 2007 to 11% in 2017. Obviously, that's not much help for uh, private renters, for example, um, but it has been a, a big boost to household incomes overall over the last decade. Uh, can we rely on these trends uh, in future? No. Um, uh, there is more that can be done on employment, um, but that state pension age effect especially is going to disappear uh, next year at least, and unemployment is already uh, now very low at 3.8%. Uh, can we reduce, sorry, can we increase uh, average hours? Uh, probably not, that would go against that long-term downward trend uh, and it's also not clear that we'd want to do that. Uh, if you look at people's preferences, there are actually more people who want to work fewer hours than want to work more hours uh, overall. And obviously that uh, fall in interest rates can't now be repeated. Um, so what should a new Prime Minister or government do to drive inclusive growth? Um, there are some key lessons from from this history. Uh, clearly there's, there's no substitute for sustained productivity growth and hourly wage growth. That's easier said than done, of course, but um, that's uh, the big picture. Uh, second, um, there's still a lot more that can be done in terms of female employment incomes. Uh, over the past decade, the, that's the, the income that's grown, whereas male employment income uh, has actually shrunk. Um, and in the course of uh, our research, we spoke to low to middle income parents. Some of them are quite happy with the number of hours they're working, 
and don't want to sacrifice any more time with their children. Um, but uh, many made it clear that um, it's uh, the cost of childcare and disincentives in the benefit system that stop them from uh, working uh, any more hours. So there's more, more that can be done there. Uh, and in terms of ensuring that growth is inclusive, um, there's obviously more that can be done in terms of improving uh, the distribution of market incomes, reducing inequality there, which is quite high by international standards. But there's also uh, a real need to use the tax and benefit system uh, to help um, parents and children, especially, for example, where that's more the role of the tax and benefit system than of um, the market. Uh, if we look at uh, in-work poverty, for example, which I know the Shadow Chancellor is going to talk more about, um, of the eight and a half million people in in-work poverty, uh, around two-thirds of those are uh, children and parents. Um, so it's important that the, the tax and benefit system uh, plays its part there. So just to, to quickly wrap up, um, it's not been a great two years uh, for living standards since the recession, uh, sorry, since the referendum. Um, and that comes on top of the financial crisis. Um, so overall, the, the past decade or so has been um, a pretty bad one for productivity growth and wage growth, uh, the usual long-term drivers of living standards improvements. Uh, in that absence, there have been some things that have propped up uh, living standards, like the impressive employment performance, uh, that uh, pause in the long-term hours decline, uh, and that boost to people with mortgages. But those are really reaching their limits or actually now going into reverse. Uh, so the, the next Prime Minister, or indeed the next government, uh, really needs to focus on the fundamentals of high productivity, uh, continuing the, the positive trends on fem female employment incomes, uh, and getting both pre-distribution and redistribution right. Thanks. Thank Thanks for inviting me again um, to speak today. Um, and I always begin by thanking the um, Resolution Foundation for the Living Standards Audit. It's a quality piece of work and it's an outstanding detailed piece of research. Um, and thanks, because it's, I think it does raise the level of debate about these issues uh, and uh, actually is shaping, is shaping the agenda now that um, any incoming Prime Minister or any government will need to, will need to cr face. Um, I think there are very s several stark lessons there for politicians of all political parties now. Um, what comes across loud and clear is that there are both structural and political drivers for living standards for growth and for the inequality of, for those living standards. Um, we appear, uh, and the Living Standards Report tells us, and I quote, to be living through an unprecedented period of rising inequality and falling incomes at the bottom of the distribution, with child poverty set to reach new highs in the coming years. That's a quote directly from the report. But I also, also want to quote from the report, because as history tells us, and I quote, it doesn't have to be like this. I said in a different context at the weekend that we must confront the world as it is today, which means examining anew the solutions that have worked in the past so we must think carefully about the policy implications when the Resolution Foundation researchers tell us in Section 5 of the report that headline figures on inequality hide a trend of rapidly increasing earnings inequality. It's partially, yes, upset by rises in headline employment figures, but they cannot continue forever, as the report points out. And even politicians who are intensely relaxed about the earnings of the filthy rich must worry that since 2003, the typical non-pensioner income has risen by just 7%. While for those in the 25 to 31 age group, typical incomes have actually fallen since the mid-2000s. So something is clearly wrong and we have to address it. So I want to take the insights from the Resolution Foundation report as a starting point for laying out what I believe a government can achieve and how I intend the next Labour government to achieve it. We take as our starting point the goal of totally eradicating poverty, of course. Nothing less should be the aim of a socialist government. 
and you'll have seen Jeremy Corbyn's recent announcement that we will replace the Social Mobility Commission with a Social Justice Commission, with a responsible minister in the Treasury to drive the agenda forward. And I've already appointed Lynn Brown MP to my team to lead on this. Behind the concept of social mobility is the belief that poverty is okay as long as some people are given the opportunity to climb out of it, leaving others behind. I reject that completely. And I want to see a society with higher living standards for everyone, as well as one in which nobody lacks the means to survive or has to choose between life's essentials. There is now a widespread acceptance, on the left at least, that the political class has not paid enough attention to questions about how the economy is structured or of the importance of creating a society that doesn't need large-scale redistribution to keep people in good jobs and thriving communities. Under the last Labour government, the continued decline of the manufacturing sector and thriving regional econo economies was compensated for by the growth of redistributive in-work benefits. And we should never underestimate the number of lives that effort changed after the neglect of the preceding decades. But that work was largely undone within one parliament by the coalition following the financial crisis. It was just easy for them to turn off the taps and plunge people into poverty. It was a far less robust settlement than that created by the Attlee government, most of which took decades to undo. So that has to be the first strand of any serious attempt to address inequalities of income, wealth, region or age. And it includes higher minimum wages, stronger trade union rights, sectoral collective bargaining, rewriting of corporate governance, an active industrial strategy, regional development banks underwritten by central government, workers being given a stake in the companies they work for and putting their elected representatives on company boards. It's a rejection of the belief that it's okay if your local factory closes as long as you have the cash transfers from the finance sector in the southeast or a new warehouse opening on the edge of town paying minimum wages on zero hour contracts. Without a change in the productive economy, any redistribution mechanism will not survive. And neither will it add up to a sustainable political settlement, well, as the Leave vote in post-industrial areas confirmed. That's why I want to see a fundamental reshaping of the way our economy works as the first priority of a Labour government. Anything less will be papering over the cracks of our political and economic system. So it is about changing the balance of power in work, workplaces across the country and helping also rebalance across the country. Should, so that should be central to everything that we do. That rebalancing of power in the workplace and in the country itself. But yes, we do need to consider more than just the time we spend at work. And collectively provided services like schools and hospitals don't just bind us together as a society, they can transform our lives. Ending poverty isn't just about cash, though I'll, I will come on to that essential element as well. It's about being healthy, having a decent roof over your head, having access to educations and skills training, living in a decent and safe environment, enjoying a life in all its cultural forms. So that's why universal public service has always been a key demand of the labour movement. Freeing workers from fear of not having access to the essentials of life. And the current debate around universal basic services, I think, has helped put universal, collectively provided services back on the political agenda with a vengeance. And that's the second strand of dealing with poverty and inequality from a socialist viewpoint. It's why we've talked about free school meals, free bus services for young people, free further and higher education, free universal childcare. Of course, it's not free to deliver, of course, but funded through general taxation and made available free at the point of needs, free at the point of use, to each according to their need. Ending poverty won't be just done in the workplace. We made to make sure the essentials of life are never denied to people because of their circumstances. So parents aren't forced to choose between feeding themselves and feeding their children. Or the unemployed teenager doesn't give up a job interview because they cost five pounds in bus fares each time they go for one. And it's the collective vision of shared wants and needs which goes a long way beyond poverty prevention. 
As governments around the world are coming to terms with the need to put quality of life rather than simply economic growth at the centre of what they do, it's worth considering the huge role that public life can contribute to that general sense of well-being. Libraries, parks, public swimming pools, all of them were part of the great inheritance which local government gave people of my generation. Many of them are now closed or closed to those who can't pay subscriptions to private companies who now run them. And I think our society is poor as a result and the splintering of those social experiences that we shared has led to other inequalities. Determining, for example, whether a young person has the opportunity to learn a musical instrument or a retiree has the opportunity to enjoy adult education classes anymore. So while we rightly concentrate on lifting people out of poverty, there's no justification for those who are worse off than others being denied the quality of life that comes from green surroundings, cultural experiences, and yes, the time and space to enjoy free time. So which brings me on to the third strand of tackling poverty and inequality in all their forms. I've spoken about the need to change the way we work so there's less inequality to reduce in the first place and about how public services can ensure that nobody misses out on the basics of a healthy material and cultural life. But there'll always be a need for a strong social security system through our tax and benefit system. And it's not the only thing that matters. Um, one think tank in the analysis of our 2017 manifesto ignored the importance of the vast impact of the range of our policies on tackling poverty. But the reality is a strong social security system is essential. So there will also be a need for a social safety net for those temporarily or permanently unable to work or those thrown out of work by things outside their control. And to give us all the security we need that we will secure in our retirement and aren't, aren't one missed paycheck away from destitution as so many of our fellow citizens are. This is the, was the case in the past and it still is for many in our community. So I've made Labour's opposition to universal credit clear now on several occasions. It's leading to queues at food banks and children going hungry in school holidays. But as I alluded to it, I don't want to reinvent the tax credit system that preceded either. Um, it's worth us taking a step back, thinking before we design its replacement in government, what we think a social security system fit for the 21st century should look like, and asking ourselves some fundamental principles. How do we help people who can work, not only find work, but progress in work, enriching themselves and our economy? How do we secure those who can't work, secure them dignity and a genuinely adequate income, stepping up as a society to look after each other in times of need? And how do we re-establish the principle of universalism and entrenching social security as a public service for all, not just a safety net for all those at the margins? In a world which... Uh, a job for life is becoming, yes, a historical memory. All of this is a, crucial. Our National Policy Forum at the moment has been considering the questions over recent months, and I hope some of you will have contributed to that consideration and the debate we're having. I'll be working with Margaret Greenwood and the party members on the answers to those questions. And in our next manifesto, obviously, we'll be putting forward those proposals about how we put an immediate halt to the damaging changes that are already going through the system. None of the three policy strands I've outlined are sufficient in their own right, but only with reinforcement of each strand to eliminate poverty and reduce inequality in a sustainable way. We need a structurally different economy, a social safety net of shared public service provision, and of course a financial safety net as well. Without any of these three elements, we'll not be able to achieve the sustained eradication of poverty, the dramatic narrowing of inequality, and the transformation of people's lives that will be the central purpose of the next Labour government. The Joseph Rowntree Foundation said last year, and I quote, that in work poverty is the problem of our time. Two thirds of the children in poverty live in a working family. And that's before billions of pounds of more cuts to work age benefits that the government had planned. I'm committing today to ending this modern day scourge 
I'm committing to eliminating in-work poverty by the end of Labour's first full parliamentary team term. We'll need all three of the policy approaches I've outlined to make it happen. And to be frank, I hope to soon be in a position to make good on my commitments. And I want you to hold them, hold me to them. As Chancellor in the next Labour government, I want you to judge me on how much we reduce poverty, how much we create a more equal society, by how much people's lives change for the better, because that's our number one goal. So I want to thank the Resolution Foundation for the usual incisive analysis of the trends in recent decades. And yes, hand over to others to see if they agree or don't with the proposals and ambition that we've put forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. That is uh, a lot of ambition, but also a recognition of the complexity and the need for a strategy that comes at a problem that big from a number of different approaches. Sam, over okay. to you. Back up here. Yep. Thanks very much. And um, it's great to be invited to speak and also to follow John. There's a lot of what he said that I would have to say I agree with. It's really welcome to hear uh, about the commitment to uh, ending in-work poverty, for example, because that's a really significant development of recent years. Um, there were a few things I wanted to say, um, some of which are, are positive, but some are also kind of slightly qualifying some of the positives we heard in the earlier presentation, I would say, because I think one of the challenges when we think about these kind of stats and, the, and this kind of report is that the headline figures can sometimes uh, hide some of the more significant detail which we need to look at if we really want to deliver growth and we really want to enable more women to be in work and actually fulfilling their potential in work rather than just having a job. Um, and I think there's also, I, I just wanted to also sort of just challenge on a little bit on what he was saying about welfare reform in particular because I think there's a real urgency now because there are so many things that are not working with the universal credit system. So we do need to take a step back and we do need to redesign it, but God, we need to act quickly because families are really struggling and suffering and there are very specific things that could help them with the current system now if we were to make those changes. So are we gonna do that and sort that out or are we gonna take a step back and wait two, three years or whatever before we actually change anything? Um, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that first. And it's important to think that poverty does have a female face. You know, 90% of single parents are women. Overwhelmingly, single parent households, although we've seen their labour market participation dramatically increase, you know, single parents want to work, be absolutely clear about that. But they are in low paid work, they're in precarious employment, you know, revolving door scenarios where they, you know, get a job but then can't sustain themselves in work. And they have a universal credit system currently which does not meet their needs um, you know and we're, as a result we're making children poorer so there are specific things like the two child limit for example that's a really pernicious policy no question about it every child counts why have we got a two child limit we've got to get rid of it um, household payments not split payments bad for women bad for financial dependency bad for financial abuse we've got to get rid of it local housing allowance rates don't meet the cost of actual rents so, you know, housing benefit isn't, is, there's a shortfall and women with children in those uh, temporary accommodation are really struggling and, and, and vulnerable. Um, we've got a real problem with second earner house, in, in households. So it doesn't actually incentivise second earners to work. You know, we have the disregards in the system don't work. So we've got to correct that. So it actually, it does pay families to work. And then we don't provide enough support with childcare costs. So all of this needs to change about the, the, the current system and I would urge us, whoever is in power to do that rather than wait to redesign it all. The next point about work, I think this is really important because the first thing I would say about the report is it proves that we're right, you know, getting women into work does make a difference to the economy, but we've massively undershot what we could have achieved over the last 25 years. Women have been working below their potential and still consistently work below their potential. We know that women are often trapped in low-paid part-time work. Our economy is designed around low-paid part-time work. It's a feature of the UK economy. 75% of those part-time workers are women. You know, 13% of men work part-time, 41% of women work part-time. And what does that mean? It means that actually once they go onto that track, they can't trade up, they can't progress. So that lack of progression within their working 
uh, lives and in their career path means that actually they're always going to be undershooting what they could uh, what they could earn and that has an impact on their living standards and their household as well um, yet we know we've got the best qualified female labor force we've ever had doesn't make any sense squandering skills and talents I think the other thing to recognise within the data is that there are, you, know, you do have to take an intersectional approach because we, could, we know that Pakistani Bangladeshi women are half as likely to be in paid work as Pakistani Bangladeshi men. You know, so we have to get underneath the headline data and really look at that, and I'm pleased to see that is, is, is in the report. But it's not just about how much you earn, it's also about what you're spending your money on. And you know, John talked about investing in childcare, and that is very welcome because we know the price of childcare that parents pay in this country is incredibly high. And actually, we also know that it tends to be women who literally pay for that childcare. So it comes from their earnings. So, and even with the, the help the government is making available, you know, the government will put in two pounds for every eight pounds that you're paying for childcare. That just isn't enough. It just isn't enough to support families to be in work. And as a result, again, it has a massive impact on female uh, labour market participation and the kinds of hours that women can work. And the final thing I wanted to also flag up is um, the importance of public services. You know, women really rely on public services more than men. And it's, any cutbacks to public services hit, hit women harder. And that is part of their living standards. That's part <coughs> of the quality of life and the living standards for them and their households. So we, we have to think about the cuts in public services as being something that undermines those living standards. Um, and just a word about women in retirement, because I think it's really important when we think about the retired households that we don't just, again, think in, in a homogenous group. You know, women are considerably worse off in retirement than men. Uh, their pension savings are about a third of that of men's. So if, if you're in your 60s now, your pension pot as a woman is about a third of that of men's. Yet they need longer, they, they live longer, so they need bigger pension pots in order to sustain themselves in retirement and their care costs are more expensive because they have multiple social care needs. So what would make a difference? Absolutely invest in universal, affordable, good quality childcare and let's treat it as an investment spend. Why aren't we regarding it as an investment spend on the public books? It is. It's an infrastructure item. A decent pay period of leave for dads. Currently, we've, we design our leave system as if we're in the 1950s. We're not, you know. Let's design it so that men are actually presumed to be equal parents with women. A transformed labour market so that all jobs are available on a flexible working basis by default. Every job, unless there's a business reason for it not to be. So the employer can still say no, but you presume the default is flexible. And actually, that will open up more senior roles and more hours for women to work flexibly. A progressive social security system with a real safety net. We've lost the consensus on the safety net in our social security system in this country and we have to get it back. A real living wage. You know, we haven't got a real living wage in this country. We need a real living wage so that we're not just subsidising low pay. Six in ten of those who benefit from that will be women. Investment in social care infrastructure because women are both expected to work longer and care more. That isn't going to work. We need an infrastructure to support them. And pensions, a carer's credit for women uh, into their auto-enrolment pension so that we can correct that asset deficit for women um, and also lowering the thresholds so that employers start contributing from the first pound. So those are all the changes I'd like to see. So add to your shopping list, John. There you go. Thanks. That, that definitely ticks the box of hard, concrete proposals for uh, change. Mike, over to you. Yeah. Ooh, I thought it'd be high tech and type my notes up, but I'm not sure it fits. Okay, thank you very much uh, for inviting me. And Torsten gave me the luxury of talking about whatever I wanted to. So I want to make three points based on what's in the, today's fantastic report. <laughs> Firstly, to reiterate Torsten's point that the fact that median incomes are forecast to have fallen for two years in a row is absolutely remarkable. This has not happened outside recessions before. Why has it happened? It's because price, mostly because prices have risen thanks to the weaker pound. Does anyone want to say Brexit dividend? But also it tells us, but also it happened because of the benefit freeze. Right, and the idea behind the safety net, the benefit system, is that it protects the poorest from economic shocks. Typically these were unemployment. Uh, but if we don't link benefits and tax credits to inflation, then we're no longer protecting the poor for inflation shocks. And that's what we've seen in, 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 in today's data. 
It also means we're now in a worrying situation where living standards are not really growing and inequality is high. And it seems to me that in a situation just like that, combined with the fact that we know that inequality reduces social mobility, and so the next generation you know, don't get a fair chance. It was all those things together which meant that in the US at the turn of the decade, that led to their increased massively increased concern about inequality, where suddenly it became a mainstream topic for discussion. So that may, maybe that's going to happen in the UK soon. We'll watch this space. Okay, my second point is that the Living Standards Audit rightly draws attention to the changing fortunes of children and the older population. Now, this is not the first time people have pointed this out, but it definitely bears repeating. So the uh, median incomes of pensioners are growing, whilst those for you know the, the, those working age rates have been falling over this long period of time. Poverty rates for, for children are rising, poverty rates for pensioners are falling. So what's been going on here? Uh, well, obviously, well, basically, it's a consistent rise in incomes for those over the state pension age over the last two or three decades. Part of this is reflecting compositional changes. Every, time, every year, a new cohort of pensioners retire, and they have better private pensions and more wealth than those that precede them. So our image, our image of what a pensioner is, what an older person is, needs to change. It's different from what it was 20, 30 years ago. But it also reflects policy and policy changes. So initially, the pension credit reform in 2003, and more recently, the triple lock. Now, these have been tremendously successful, if by success you mean ensuring that the incomes of low-income pensioners don't, don't fall and you know, ensuring continued growth in living standards for this group. But there's now a huge difference in support between that provided by the pension credit and that provided by universal credit to people who could be one year apart in age. And now, no economist likes the triple lock, I'm afraid to say, and even the double lock's a bit dubious when you look at it closely. But um, so, and, you know, I, I would love that to be looked at. But more importantly, some of the key parts of the welfare system for pensioners, winter fuel payments, the pension credit, were policies designed 15, 20 years ago for basically a different demographic. <coughs> uh, in the Resolution Foundation, buried in today's report is the fact that the social security system hasn't really contributed to income growth for households since 1994. And my bet is if you look within that, you would find that it has done, it has contributed to income growth for the elderly, and it's, but it's actually reduced incomes overall for, the, for those below the, the, below the pension age. So I think it's time for a comprehensive review of the right way to support those over the state pension age and what's the fair balance between when we're designing social security system between, between the younger and the old. And I'd also love to see the Resolution Foundation bring together their different bits of work on living standards together with their work on in intergenerational fairness and also on how wealth and, inheritance, wealth and inheritances are distributed. Because it's not just the case that the elderly are getting better or better off, they also have all the wealth. And my third point is on the very rich. I realise this is a living standards audit and not a sort of state of the nation piece on inequality. Um, and Resolution Foundation has been very good at pointing out that the, the statistics that lie behind today's report produced by the DWP and the ONS, they don't capture very well the incomes of the top 1%. In the meantime, you know, we can learn more by going to data based on tax returns. And that allows us not just to get at the income of the top 1% and, and work out what that is accurately, but we can zoom in and look at the top 0.1% or 0.01%. And that's what I did in my book. Now that data is a little bit out of date compared with that in today's report, but what we can see is that after taking a big hit in the financial crisis, there's now a very clear upward trend to very top incomes. So by 2015-16, the share of income going to the very, very top, that's the richest 0.01%, about 5,000 people, was almost back at record high levels. The, high, the record year was 2009. Now, does this have any effect on living standards overall? Well, we probably need a whole other event to discuss that, but there are certainly plenty of economists, including me, who think that it definitely does. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. There's a good reminder to all of us that if you're not in the top 5,000 people in the country, there's a very strong incentive to get there. <laughs> right, let's uh, get your questions. There should be two mics roaming around. OK, let's take one here in the front. Carl, are you going to come straight through this here? And I'm take a gentleman at the front, right here, and start us off. And then Carl, just here. Go ahead, sir. Give us your name. Yeah, w w William Claxton Smith. Uh, given the unremittedly gloomy picture painted by all the panellists, I wondered if any of them could explain why self-reported happiness in this country has continued to rise. That's a great question. We'll come back. Uh, Chris Giles from the Financial Times. A question for John. Um, John, your, your second two pillars uh, were, if they're to be meaningful, were clearly expensive to improve public services and to improve the social safety net. So I wanted to ask you how ultimately you really want to fund this. Is this through more borrowing, more taxes, or your first pillar, creating more income for everyone? Just wanted to get a sense of where, where you think the funding is coming from. 
Okay, and then should we get a third question? There's a lady right at the back over here, Cara, the far corner. Well, just to, while we wait for walking to occur, obviously we showed you that incomes are up three, three times since the 1960s, so you know, it's all better than when the music was coming out. Thank you. Um, Anna Dixon from the Centre for Ageing Better. Um, I'd like the panel to comment on the fact that there are 1.8 million uh, low and middle income households in work that we did with the Resolution Foundation uh, between 50 and state pension age. The majority of them are economically inactive. And um, Adam, I think in your analysis, you talked about unemployment, but you didn't talk about the large numbers of people, including women who are caring, who are economically inactive, and whether we should be and disabled people and older workers. So is there an opportunity there, and what policies would you be recommending to John about how to close the economic activity gap for people between 50 and state pension age? Okay, great questions. John, do you want to um, take Chris's first, and then we can all deal with why we're so happy? Okay. <laughs> in terms of what we've, we've set out in the last manifesto, which was a fairly comprehensive program of looking at most of these issues and investing in them, we, we were looking at uh, a new income tax system which was much fairer, so yeah, the top 5% paying more. Um, and we were also looking at um, a range of policies which would gain us, we think, the income to inject into our public services and tackle many of the issues that were raised with regard to our social security system as well. And that, in, that included um, reverse incorporation tax cuts, not all of them, but quite a sizable number of them. Introducing a financial transaction tax, reversing some of the inheritance tax cuts that have been given away as well. And then also cutting back on, um, on some of the um, areas in which we felt that the government um, had failed to, I suppose, acknowledge acknowledge the divisions within our society, the inequality that they created. And that included a fairly um, detailed examination of tax evasion and tax avoidance. Now that program that, that we put forward included some in additional measures that some people thought novel but operate elsewhere in the country, elsewhere in the, in the globe. For example, levies on foreign companies over, over owning properties in this country, that sort of thing. We also put in the manifesto this issue around wealth um, we did put in the exploration of a land value tax on non-residential properties too, and we're working on that at the moment. We're looking to see how we can find a stable financial base for a local government. So that includes, yes, looking at the council tax system, revisions to business tax, looking at internet um, charging as well, the internet um, taxation too. The government's proposals we don't think so far we've heard go far enough. And then looking at val land value taxation, as I said, on, on non-residential properties. 40% of our last manifesto was to be delivered by local government and they haven't got a financial stable base and they haven't got the capacity as yet, so that's what we're trying, trying to build up at the moment. Um, the issues that, that we'll now confront as well um, is exactly the, as the report set out, our big problem on income is about productivity and the, the reasons as the report identifies is lack of investment over a long period. Um, relying upon increases in employment rather than investment so that we can get the high skills and the high wages that people can earn. And it is about regional inequalities. So at the moment, um, we're touring around the country. Every, sat every other Saturday, we're going around the country, meeting in towns, we're calling town meetings, 150, 250 people turn up, and we talk about their local economy. And it is largely in areas that did vote Brexit. Um, it's trying to understand the reasons for that. And a lot of it that's coming out is is the issue around lack of investment in their particular area where they've lost their manufacturing base, nothing's replaced it apart from low wage, low wage employment. And it is down to some basics, just reopening the railway line, investing in the broadband uh, speeds within the particular area, making sure that the local colleges and schools are properly funded to get the schools training and addressing those issues. So it is about investing to grow. So we've put a package of a 10 year programme in our last manifesto of £250 billion capex, straightforward government department investment in the infrastructure, setting up a national investment bank with another £250 billion, so £500 billion over a 10-year programme of investment in the economy. All of that makes our, all our proposals not just affordable, but absolutely affordable and essential. So every one of those policies we costed out fairly heavily. We're now going through another exercise because there could be a general election. We've been doing it for the last 18 months. 
of preparing the new manifesto, but also pr preparation for government exercise, going over the costings of all our past policies, looking at the new ones as well, and on the reform package around universal credit, an immediate package which is tackling most of the issues that you identified, the two child limit, scrapping the bedroom tax, making sure we overcome the household payments issue, and also housing allowances. All of that we'll put in very early on whilst we redesign the new safety net. So it's, it's all, uh, with a growing economy in particular, and an economy that's invested in, invested to grow, particularly around a green industrial revolution, all of this is perfectly affordable. It's just the political will that's needed to ensure it happens. Do you, um, do you, think, do you ever think that well, for one reading of the um, current leadership election in the Conservative Party is that um, on the current budget, at least, so on the capital budget, as you've just set out, your plan is for a significant borrowing to invest. Um, but on the current budget, it is a funded, your manifesto is a funded package, significant tax rises for a significant increase in the size of the state. The, um, that is obviously not what's going on currently in the Conservative Party, which is a choice to borrow more, to spend more and to tax less. The, um, so are you kind of, is it weird feeling a bit more fiscally conservative than Tory on the current budget? We did a costing of Boris's and Boris Johnson's and Jeremy Hunt's proposals so far. <laughs> In our last manifesto, we were looking at about £49 billion pounds worth of expenditure. Yeah. So far, they've spent £100 billion. So it does make me look a fiscal moderate, which is a rather, rather a bit of a turnaround. So what's the conclusion from that? You should be more radical or they should be more moderate? The conclusion is look to our next manifesto. Oh, John. Okay. Hold up. Okay. Well, um, the, reality, the, reality, look, the reality is, is that they don't believe that they can deliver what they're promising in this um, selectorate. To what they're promising to their selectorate, they don't believe that either. Neither does Philip Hammond, for that matter. Particularly, particularly if we go for a No Deal Brexit, which would be a disaster, and they know that. So what we're doing is, I think we're steadily building a new manifesto. Yes, based upon what we said in 2017, but radicalising it as well. But making sure that everything we do in terms of the costings and the implementation, the pragmatic way we implement it, is tested to almost destruction. So we, okay. we have a credibility when we go to the next election that may be lacking from the Conservative Party. Right, well-being. Who wants to, I've got a very strong views on this, but I'm not going to give you an answer to <laughs> On well-being, and then obviously we should touch Anna's question on. Well, I think again, it depends on what you're looking at. So if you look at. Government statistics. Well, but there are other indicators that are quite worrying, which counter that picture. So if you look at self-harm amongst teenage girls, for example, about one in five, it's really high. So I think you know, there are certain groups of the population who are very unhappy uh, and who are really struggling. And can I just come back on that? Yeah, point definitely. Um, oh. I think the key thing is about how you define economic inactivity. So if you're caring for someone, yeah. Yeah. we would argue that is an economic contribution and it should not be defined as economic inactivity. And part of the problem we have is that invisibility of caring, whether it be caring for children, older relatives, disabled people, whatever. So we have to redefine exactly. economic inactivity. Exactly. I think that... It's one of the key debates that we now have to have. We started it last year, and I think others are getting on board on that, how we build it into the definition of GDP and how we measure the economy. Just on the well-being issue, um, we were working with the New Zealand government because they've introduced a well-being budget. Um, again, it's stimulated the debate about how you construct budgets. It's around a limited number of defined aims, um, but Jonathan Ashworth in our team now is now leading on constructing a well-being agenda and then translating that into a well-being um, budget and how we go forward. I think it will be one of the key themes that we'll be developing as we run into the next general election, definitely. Uh, I'd like you, I'm, I think some of the um, happiness measures that we see are somewhat spurious, uh, but even there, even the existing measures that you see, you'll see a vast range right the way across the country as well, of particular areas as well, where people are deeply unhappy and it is about the quality of life overall and in the groups that we've been bringing together to talk about what does well-being mean to them, it is some very basic stuff. It is you know, having access to a decent roof over your head and living in a safe environment, but also there is cultural aspects to this that people are being denied now, uh, which maybe in my generation we had access to and also for free. Mike, I'm not sure I have any great ideas. I mean, it is noticeable, of course, that the employment is very, very high. I mean, that's the flip side of, of productivity growing very, very slowly. And uh, we know that one of the things that really makes you unhappy is not having a job when you want one. So I mean, yeah, it, could be, it could be that. 
definitely, you can definitely see that in the data. Yeah. You see employment, high employment helping well-being. It was just a separate thing. So for those of us that don't spend their life in the data, the well-being data tells you lots of things. Being living near a park, it's good for your yeah. well-being, it tells you lots of other things. Being healthy, good job, house, all that stuff, a partner you actually like, who knew. The, um, uh, but it does also show a slightly worrying kind of general drift upward over like 20 years, which makes me at some point think, and this is all a subjective well-being, yeah? So people are being asked, how do they feel? So maybe it's just a kind of, you've all become Americans. So you kind of want to say, how, how are you feeling today? In the old days, we're British and we were like, terrible. No, but and now we just say, yeah, yeah. it's great. Okay. The br housing has become a key policy in terms of housing, uh, yeah. well-being. It isn't just having a decent roof over your head. It's having, being able to afford a property, either rent or, or purchase near to your family as well. So some of the social structures are broken down too, which then has knock-on consequences for the care, particularly of elderly, where the family networks then break down. And it isn't just because people are more mobile, it's also because people are being forced out of areas because their children can't afford to buy or rent in up to the area. Right, let's get some more questions uh, from you. There's a gentleman in the middle there. And then where's the other one called? No, there's the lady at the back there. That will take both together. Go ahead, sir. Thank you, uh, Dan Julian here. Um, question mainly for John. You spoke earlier about um, childcare, bus passes yeah. for st uh, students, and so on, and then uh, spoke about universal basic services. Yeah. Now you've um, promised that you would trial UBI. Oh yeah. yeah. Um, would you consider a trial of universal basic services in that respect as well? Yeah. Should I come on that quickly? Well, let's grab this. Okay. Two, Hello, uh, Sarah Horner from the Learning and Work Institute. A lot of our work is also, uh, as mentioned, finding very um, hyper and local regional differences. Um, so we're looking at ways of, of, of tackling this. So one of the things we're looking at is devolution devolved administration. So I wondered what role you think that might play in solving these problems. Great, and then to my next to you. Carl Schneider, Farmers Weekly. We've heard a bit about regional variations in poverty and inequality, but uh, is there any consideration either in the report or in the, the discussions in the Labour Party about rural, uh, the differences between yeah. rural and urban areas? Mm -hmm. I, the impression we certainly get is that there's a lot of poverty and certainly a lot of inequality, and often in rural areas, the provision of public services is far worse yeah. than in urban areas. Yeah. Okay, that's great. There's a lot there, John. Do you want to okay, let me just come back on that one. We've been We've been doing work around r rural and coastal towns in particular. Um, I was down in Stroud, we one, had one of our economic conferences down in Stroud uh, two weeks ago. Um, it's interesting what comes out about quality of life in those areas. It isn't just about employment. The bus service becomes absolutely key. Every, every meeting we've done it outside of London itself, um, the bus provision has been one of those areas. That's why the idea of universal basic service for young people, access to bus has been quite key. And it's interesting around that, in the rural towns, you know, it, they're talking about the bus service, not just as a service, but also the impact on the high street it has, that sort of thing. Um, and there's other, other aspects in um, non-city areas which largely come down to basic infrastructure too. Um, I, I just tell that I, we did a session in Colne up in Lancashire near Skipton and they wanted to reopen the railway line. Um, relatively cheaply and, and they've worked out their economic plans of the, uh, how it could happen and also how it would help people commute in, as well. Uh, I signed up to that, thank goodness, because they then produced a petition I'd signed 30 years ago, so I could do it. But it's, it's, it, it, it's, it's things like that. It's not just rural areas, coastal towns and work has been, quite a lot of work has been done around coastal towns too, but it is, a lot of it is around some basic infrastructure to stimulate the local economy and people are buzzing with ideas about how that can be done. And a lot of the ideas that are coming forward now are also about the green industrial revolution and about how, how in those areas they can look at alternative energy sources that they can use uh, that will then feed in. But they want to see, it's about a sense of place as well, and they want to see any initiative going on within their area participating in that initiative, but also gaining the benefits from it locally. And to a certain extent, that's where land value taxation comes, comes in as well. Um, the issue around uh, devolution, etc. Uh, as I said, 40% uh, of our last manifesto was meant to be delivered by local government. Our big concern there is capacity. So we're looking at how we can build capacity over time and whether or not we need agencies working alongside local government in that initial period and how, that, how that's best done. 
we are trying to make sure that we devolve not powers but resources as well. Um, and I cheered Mark Carney up, as you know, by saying we're moving part of the Bank of England to Birmingham. And uh, you won't be there. No, that's true. We'll see who else to be in Washington. Yeah, right? well, or elsewhere maybe. Anyway. Um, and also we are splitting up the um, number 11 and the National Transformation Fund teams will go north um, again to make sure that they're keyed into key decision makers then in where we want to redistribute investment over time towards the north itself. On UBS and UBI, UBI at the moment we've got Guy Standing with Ed Metherband touring around the country at the moment doing meetings and discussions um, about um, Ed's big thing is to try and get in the next manifesto at least a commitment to a pilot somewhere for UBI and we've got local authorities like Liverpool, Coventry and elsewhere bidding for that. Um, and with regard to UBS, um, we're literally consulting people now on what universal basic services they think would most effectively improve the quality of their lives. And we, we may be putting proposals up within the next manifesto to say these are the ones that we're going for but also uh, we'd welcome uh, areas of experimentation as well, which, which will be quite interesting, I think. Great. Adam, on this regional thing, do you want to touch on any of that, particularly on the reports last week? Oh. Yeah, there are limits to what we can do with the data. It doesn't tend to, to go into the kind of detail of rural versus urban areas. Um, but there are clearly big regional differences across the country, though, in the report. We, we highlight that there has been some convergence in terms of household incomes across the country, actually. Uh, even if um, in terms of productivity there are still uh, vast gaps across the country. Um, but uh, as other people have said, there are clearly different challenges in, uh, in different parts of the country. Um, poor public services and uh, infrastructure in some rural areas, uh, but cheap housing, whereas in, in parts of London especially, you have exactly the opposite problem. Uh, so you need the, the full range of uh, policy solutions. <coughs> <coughs> yeah, so UBI, I think the one thing I think I would caution about UBI is that all the stuff I've seen about it so far is completely devoid of any gender analysis. And I think you really do have to take quite a sophisticated look at it to understand how you could inadvertently make some women, yeah. some households poorer through introducing a UBI system. So I would just be a bit that's worried a about point. that. We, you know, want to make sure that that's in there. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, and then on the regional stuff, we're working with um, Andy Burnham in Manchester and Andy Street in, in Birmingham to help the combined authorities there to take a bit of a gendered approach to their industrial strategy, their employment strategy, because again, they won't deliver their strategic objectives unless they also get more women into work and improve uh, the kind of work that's available to women. So that's really fundamental. Um, and transport is really important for women. Bus service is really, really important for women getting to and from childcare, to and from work. So, you know, again, big gender implications. You have to have that kind of lens on when you think about it. Mike? Not really anything to say. We'll have more Next. questions. Okay, let's get another set of questions. Gentleman right here. And there's a lady here, Carol. Go ahead, sir. Hi, Graeme Hunter. And um, what part could a job guarantee play in raising living standards? Because after all, it would provide a job for people where they are, as they are, and it would ensure an effective floor on wages and working conditions. Great. I wonder if what John, could, Julia Brannan, um, mm. University College London, I wonder if John could say something about. Um, political pri priorities and time spans for yeah. um, this very visionary and <laughs> wide, wide ranging programme. Okay, uh, and one from over here. There's a gentleman at the far right. Uh, it's the first time I've been on the far right in my life. <laughs> <laughs> You're very young, there's still time. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've got a question for John. You did mention um, that it, the work of the last Labour government was undone in one parliament. Um, and I was just wondering, would you be willing to... Um, I know it's quite hard because the parties are at radical ends at the current moment in time, but if you were to be elected, um, would the Labour government be willing to reach out and build some sort of consensus in the definitions of inequality, etc., because uh, the same work that you could be talking about right now could be undone again yeah. by the next parliament. So, 
Uh, are you happy to commit to that right now that you'd be reaching out uh, across Parliament if elected? Okay, why don't we take the, those Julia's and, and the far right question, as it were, um, uh, together, which are really about the political economy of change, prioritisations, timing, what's the relationship between firm agenda of your own versus building a longer term consensus? Okay. Uh, I'm a follower of Antonio Gramsci, so I, I, I'm quite keen on hegemonising the debate in whatever way we can. And if that means building a consensus, working with others, of course we will do. Um, and we've tried to do that th throughout. And the stage we're at now is, uh, is trying to open up a, a, a wider debate as we possibly can about some of these concepts. And I, what's and that's why the Resolution Foundation, uh, and I'm not flattering you, but the Resolution Foundation does play a major contribution in opening that debate up, and it works on a cross-party basis. It enables us then to come together to look at some of the hard stats and then learn some lessons together. And, and that's the way we'll continuously work when, when we when we go in, into government around inequality. It is it is it is trying to make sure. That in we, when we discuss inequality, we do it in this broad-ranging debate. This, I, I think the word, the expression "well-being" doesn't really cover it, but it, it includes the, all those elements about well-being, and that's why this morning I'm trying to point out the three strands, which is about structural change, it is about universal services, and it is about the, the, the safety net. And I think that's broadening the debate, and I think we are winning the argument on that. And even. Even some elements of the Conservative leadership election at the moment have had to address some of these issues, even if they've done it fairly partially and not particularly ser seriously. So no, we'll, we'll seek to build consensus all the way we possibly can. And when it comes to priorities at the moment... Oh, hello. My priority is the light going back on. Whoever's leaning at the back, could you press the light back on? <laughs> I'm keen that you film this event, but I'm equally keen I can see. Just press the top of it. Someone's coming around to help you with the switch. <laughs> Sorry, John, keep going with your priorities. Okay, okay. Oh, uh, well, it turns okay. out the Lord returns. I was going to say, is there anyone out there? But there you are. Okay. Okay. Um, look, at the moment, obviously, well, there's the potential for a general election in October. So all our discussions now are around our first Queen's speech and our first budget. And that will be determined in our usual democratic way within the, within the party. But on the first budget, we work in now as... We've, we've been denied access to the civil servants, unfortunately, um, in the normal way, um, by political decision. But what we've done is communicate with the civil servants directly, even though they can't communicate back to us. And we've set out how we want, in the, the first eight to ten weeks, our first budget prepared by the OBR. We've written to the OBR about the range of issues that we want them to look into, broader than they are at the moment, and that includes issues around inequality and the environment, etc. Um, so we're preparing all of that doing all the costings. Now in the priorities, you can imagine, I can't t tell you now what the final decisions will, will be made, but you can imagine that we want to lift people out of poverty as rapidly as possible. So that means getting a, a real living wage, 10 pounds an hour into people's pockets as rapidly as possible. The emergency reforms virtually on universal credit that we dramatically need early on in any first Queen's speech. But also we've got to we've got to get the investment potential out there to start growing the economy. And that does mean, you know, our top priority is, is our existence. So it does mean tackling climate change and the green industrial revolution. So that's the sort of debates that are happening at the moment and that will lead us into uh, the autumn. If a general election then then comes, we'll be ready with our first Queen's speech, our first budget. And for a lot of those policies, um, we've, we're at that stage where we've developed the implementation manuals, we've got draft legislation ready to go, um, and it will be around tackling some of the most grotesque levels of inequality and poverty that we're experiencing at the moment, because most of us are coming back from our constituencies and never experienced it this bad in the, in the past, and some of it is quite heartrending. Is there anything that's a really important to like thing for you that you'd like to have change in the country, but you can't be a priority for the initial phase? The anyway, we've already decided, look, I'd like that, but I can't have it because I've got this other stuff. It's, it's, trying to, it's trying to make sure that we have a plan for the full five years. So it is about a long-term economic plan. It is in making sure that we stagger our proposals so that they're implementable. And the, the issue there is capacity. We're inheriting, uh, we're inheriting a government structure in particular that hasn't, well, we've seen it, didn't even have the capacity to deal with Brexit. You know, didn't allocate resources effectively, and that's at every level. It isn't just about central governments, at local government and agencies as well that have been uh, degraded in terms of the resources that have been applied to them. So the issue for us is 
making sure that you, our, our ambitions are matched by the resources, of course, and matched by the detail of policy, but also matched by the capacity that there is out there that we have to build up over time as well. And I think that's that's complex, but we'll do it. Now, Mike, you, as I say, you've, we've plugged your book on poverty, <laughs> available at All Good upstairs in a second. But, the, um, but on, what does the last 20 years teach you about what priorities and political priorities should be for people that want to entrench reductions in inequality? Oh, uh, <laughs> an instant comment on, uh, on, on Labour's uh, manifesto. I think um, I'll just draw on some of the work that I did looking at in work poverty you know, a couple of decades ago, and that was funded by the Joseph Rowntree Foundation. They were looking at how to eliminate child poverty. And it was very clear that just doing one thing wasn't going to be enough. You know, there's no point continuing the the the, the, the Blair Brown uh, tradition of, of just putting more and more money into the child tax credit and other ones because it it, you know, it, it it just soon stops becoming effective. And so the, what we you know, what they identified a decade or so ago is you have to do everything. So you you have to have the higher minimum wage alongside a decent social security system. I mean, we know at the moment that if you put the uh, put up the living wage. Um, families towards the bottom lose a large chunk of that because you know, the universal credit goes down and they pay taxes on it. So, but the higher and higher you make the, the living wage and the more you reform your social security and it works all at the same time, you can then arrange it so that higher wages do actually lead to higher living standards for low income families. So a bit of a sound. Well, just on the consensus point actually, um, and that's been quite important for us in terms of building consensus around you know, gender equality and the things that will progress gender equality. You know, so now we have recommendations on gender pay gap reporting or sexual harassment that are as likely to be taken forward and are being taken forward by Conservative government as they are by Labour politicians. And I think that's quite a change over the last 10 years compared to where we mm. used to be. Mm. Uh, yesterday we had a Conservative MP promoting flexible working by default in the private members bill. You know, these, this shows that we've embedded something on gender equality. I think we've still got a huge distance to travel though across many other aspects of this agenda and I think we've lost a lot of the consensus on social security that we used to have um, and I think part of even the language we use has changed actually. We don't talk about social security as much as <coughs> we talk about welfare so I yeah. think we've got to get back to a place where we think about you know, how we care for people within our social security system. It's interesting that politicians can't get away with the language on welfare that they were only using four years ago. They wouldn't be able to. We, met, we never refer yep, to the guarantee. jobs guarantee. It's a debate we're having at the moment, but at the moment, the structural changes that we're advocating, both in terms of the restoration of trade union rights, sectoral collective bargaining, um, representation on boards, the inclusive ownership fund, the transfer of shares to workers collectively as well, the development of cooperation, those policies effectively will provide, I think, sufficient numbers of work, for employment for people. Um, but in addition to that, more importantly, it will give people a greater control of their working lives. And actually, in those companies where there is a greater stake of worker in, in ownership and involvement, they're the ones that actually have higher levels of productivity and longer term decision making. Adam? Following on from what Mike was saying, I think the experience of uh, the past few decades shows that to the tax and benefit system isn't the, the only thing that matters, but uh, it, it can have a, a real impact very rapidly. Uh, so when there was a commitment to reduce child poverty, uh, the government was able to, to do that fairly rapidly. Uh, you can even act within a, <coughs> uh, within a year um, to change taxes and benefits, uh, and we know it, it does feed through into real change. Um, to go back to the, the, the question, um, it is also quite easy to re reverse, though not, not as easy as to do in the first place. Um, but yeah, it can have a, a, a real impact very quickly. Just to channel um, Philip Hammond for a second, given that nobody's been coming from the even medium right, uh, let alone the far right. So just another, another reading of kind of where we are. So you, you will have all seen yesterday, labour market stats out yesterday showing Earnings growth, nominal earnings growth at 3.6%, highest since the crisis. Real earnings growth at 1.6, 1.7, something like that. Highest since the zero inflation phase that we mentioned earlier in 2015. Um, do we think if we got rid of, somehow magically, let's not get into that, the economic uncertainty that's clearly holding back business investment and lots of things at the moment, that the tight labour market that it has taken us 10 years to build up, we would start to be seeing... <coughs> growth that we can't see in the stats about the past. Mike, give us your oh. <coughs> Excuse me. case of optimism. What's your case? <laughs> What's your case on the case? Um, I'm, I'm not that optimistic, no. I think it's more, uh, we've 
something, you know, the balance of power has been changing between employers, employee, employers and employees. I think that's what's keeping pay growth down. It's not just uncertainty in the last couple of years. Do you think things are about to just take off? No, um, I have I've real, I've real anxieties. I think uh, look, I, I do this tea offensive walk, you know, all around the city. Asset managers, pension fund managers, banks, chief executive companies, etc. Um, it isn't just Brexit. I think there's a lack of confidence in the economy overall. There's a lack of confidence because of the lack of state involvement in some of the infrastructure developments that we need and research and development in particular. That's the first thing. So I don't think it's just about Brexit. I think there's greater uncertainty about where this country is going for the future. Now that's why when we're setting out our plans, we're largely on the same page with the major investors and that's built our credibility. The second issue, exactly as Mike has said, is about the balance of power between capital and labour itself. If you look at um, the decline of collective sector or collective bargaining, it's, it's that decline, you know, 25 years ago, 80% of us were covered, our wages were covered by collective bargaining in that way. Now about 20%, that decline has actually, I think, demonstrated that the decline in the respective powers, and as a result of that, the respective distribution of the income and wealth within our society as well. Okay, look, let's um, uh, wrap up on that so people can um, get to their days and we can deliver you one minute under uh, schedule because it's important to stick to your promises. You know, <laughs> that's so look, can we thank all the panel for having their conversation today? <laughs> if, if nothing else, at least when it comes to incomes inequality, there's a lot of data to dig into and there's a lot of doing to be done. So <laughs> off everyone goes, go and sort it out. Well done, Adam. That was great. That was good. Thanks. Thanks.